Friday, then I kind of started early. All right. Yeah, I think she'll have off on this one. Kind of started early, guys. Okay, sorry. Sorry, guys. It's been a while before I begin. I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to get. Okay, Arbiter. Thanks, bro. I hope it's clear. I don't know. My camera. Oh, boy. Hope it's not too blurry. But anyway. Okay, sorry, man. Okay, guys, I'm just going to wait a few more minutes. I don't know what your question is. Sammy son, why would you post the question when I have a topic? I don't get it. I don't understand. Love, I love my Christian brothers and sisters. I love you. I pray I can be the Lord Jesus Christ to you guys. But you guys frustrate me sometimes. Don't get don't take it personally. All right? I have a topic and someone wants to ask me a question. Okay. Sammy son, if your question is not related to the gospel, I'm going to ban you. Oh, boy. Okay. Jesus is our Passover lamb. As you guys can see over the years, I've gotten less patient. I get more frustrated, even though I'm asking the Lord Jesus Christ to help me. <sighs> what are you going to do? I'm a work in progress. My hope is in Jesus Christ that by the power of the Spirit, he transforms me, crucifies my flesh, destroys my flesh, and saves me from my own sinfulness. And fill me with power to walk in the Holy Spirit and be filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is patience. May the Father of our Lord Jesus, for the sake of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, get me patience and self-control in Jesus' name. Yeah, anyway. We're going to wait a few more minutes, folks. Uh, have I haven't done this for, what, a couple weeks now? Hopefully, the Lord Jesus will be pleased to use me in spite of my imperfections and my carnal fleshly struggles. May he crucify my flesh and crucify all our flesh, mortify our flesh and destroy the fruit of our flesh and fill us with the Holy Spirit, with life and power and fruit from the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ, to be transformed, to conform the image of our God and save the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Please, Father, for the sake of the Lord Jesus, wash us, purify us, cleanse us in the holy blood of the Lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ, fill us with the Holy Spirit and constrain us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Crucify our flesh to walk in the life of the Spirit and not in the deeds of the flesh. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you anoint the words of my mouth to speak truth without error. Save me from error, from stammering, from unrighteous anger, from grieving you. Please, Holy Spirit, fill everyone here. Fill everyone who comes with your presence and clothe us with your presence and cover us with the blood of Jesus and do that for our loved ones, Holy Spirit. In my case, my daughters, wash them in the blood of Jesus. Seal them, Holy Spirit, for your glory, for the glory of Jesus. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you fill my, my lungs and my chest and my throat with life, to speak life, to speak your word, to glorify Jesus Christ and save us from the attacks of the enemy. Please, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we ask this. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, increase in us. May we decrease and you increase, Lord Jesus, and beatify us with your beauty and your holiness, Lord Jesus, to be more like you. And please have mercy on us and be patient with us and forgive us and forgive me. We love you, Father, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Guys, just want to let you know, we did get a new computer. That new computer is with David Wood. We're going to get it set up as soon as possible. So thank you for your support. He's had the computer for a couple of months now. It's just been me. I haven't gotten around to getting it from him, and that's my fault. But in Jesus' name, we're going to have it up and running so that we can use a better computer with a better camera with better sound quality, right? In Jesus' name, Father. Now we got two dear brothers here that helped me, First Last and Orbiter. They helped me by posting verses, but I think they're also, uh, what do you guys also, um, did I make you admins? 
because we're going to get trolls attacking, right? We're going to get some trolls attacking. And as we wait, I'm going to give you guys a couple more minutes in Jesus' name. As the Lord Jesus prepares me, keep praying for me that the Holy Spirit will give me the power to get healthier, to get my health back, to lose this weight and get my health back for the glory of Jesus, to see my girls grow up to be godly women, and to give me the holiness I need to delight the heart of Jesus Christ, right? Now, are you guys admins? First last, you're an admin, right? Sorry, I keep shaking the table. Right. They has the ban hammer. I don't know what the ban hammer means. We're going to wait a few more minutes. All right. We're going to discuss the gospel. Revelation, good to see you. Good to see many of you folks. Lord Jesus willing, I have two big important dates in my life that I need to be freed from. So if you guys believe that the Lord Jesus has set me apart to glorify him and to the, do the work of ministry, Pray for August 14, August 19, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'll be finally set free from these trials, free to travel and glorify Jesus Christ. And pray the Lord will release me to start a new life in a new state. Guys, please pray for that so I can finally be free. Two years of hell. May the blood of Jesus set us free. All right. Man, see, if it was David Wood, we'd have a thousand people. That's my fault because I haven't been regularly live streaming or updating my channel only 58 <laughs> i'm not very loved where is the love that you've been dreaming of rebel mark how you doing so most of you watch that debate with the oneness pastor right we're going to get into the topic in a minute but before we get into the topic help me to help help you help me to serve you because those of you who've been with me over the years know know that I get easily distracted. I get distracted. I lose my focus, get frustrated. May the Lord Jesus save me from that and to be a blessing to you, not a stumbling block. So help me to help you focus on the topic. Don't ask questions not related to the topic. Ask questions related to the topic. And let me finish a point before you interject so that I can hopefully bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. My brother Diego was there live. Shlama Elohan. Yes, Shlama Eloch Iwan. God bless you. Sorry, brother. All righty then. What I'll do is I'll entertain a question or two before we get into the topic because I just want to give a few more minutes for other people to join us that typically join us when, when I'm live. All right. Okay, so Samson, what was your question? Holy tornado, I need it. You know, guys, I'm getting much more handsome. As you can see, I'm getting slender and more muscular and handsome. Why? I'm just like a beautiful beast. Just kidding. Thank you, Andy Shannon. I don't know what you asked me, and if it's something that I feel led by the Spirit to answer, I will. What's up, Zena? How are you, my sister? Hopefully your brothers are watching too. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants for your glory. I need to, brother. I need to. I need to get my health back. Well, you're going to have to wait for me to answer whether the Ten Commandments are a salvation issue, because if they are, then that means you believe that you're justified and saved by your faith and works. I don't believe that, right? Now, you don't have to be Protestant. <clears throat> what I want you to do, lend me your ear. If you're from a Catholic background, Orthodox background, Nestorian background, Coptic background. Here's what I'm going to ask. Take the verses I give you, prayerfully study them, ask the Holy Spirit to protect you from error, and to protect me from error, and to guide you all into all truth. And you decide whether I've interpreted the scriptures correctly. Because the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, the Holy Spirit uses imperfect human teachers to preach his perfect word. There is no human teacher on this side of eternity that understands the Bible perfectly inside and out and allows the Bible to speak for itself. All of us come to the text with assumptions, biases, and we've all been impacted by our traditions. The work of the Holy Spirit is to transform the way we think and the way we see and the way we live so that now we see the Bible the way the Holy Spirit sees it because the Holy Spirit produced the Bible. The Holy Spirit knows its meaning. The Holy Spirit is perfect in his perception of all, all things. 
So the work of the Spirit is to transform us so that we see the way he sees, because what he sees is perfect. He sees everything perfectly clearly because he is truth, and his perception is perfect, right? No flaws or imperfection in the way he sees things, because he is God, one with the Father and the Son. And the work of the Spirit is to change us where we're mistaken, where we're misunderstanding the Scriptures, so we can understand the scriptures correctly and then give us the power to live out the scriptures because it's not just knowing scriptures. We have to live it out. That's where I fail. God have mercy on me. Right? In Jesus' name. Uh, Tis uh, the boss. Don't ask me that question. I'm not interested in answering a question that an atheist asked you. Go find the answer on YouTube. I'm talking about the gospel of salvation and he wants me to answer an atheist who says that Genesis is not historical. Oh, boy. All right. Any other questions before I begin? We're going to discuss the gospel of salvation. And I have an article written about this. Well, the Bible teaches predestination. The word predestination is, is in your English Bible. The question is, what does the Bible mean when it speaks of predestination? And that's the debate between Calvinists and Arminians, right? Amen. May the Holy Spirit anoint us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Anyway, so when you ask me about predestination, the word predestination is in the Holy Bible. It is used. In fact, Orbiter, pray for him and pray for his family. Pray for the health of his family. Praise the Lord Jesus for this brother. He helps me to help you by posting verses. Now, remember one thing, though. There is a lag. By the time you hear what I have to say, it takes about a few seconds. So where does the Bible use the term predestined? Let's go to Romans 8, verse 28 to 29. Romans 8, 28 to 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 29. The question is, what does it mean when the Bible speaks of predestination? I hope you guys are happy to see me as I'm happy to see you. Pray the Holy Spirit will fill us with joy and love and peace for the glory of Jesus. I have no idea what you're talking about, number two, and I hope you're not asking me something silly because I will block you. Romans 8, 28, 29, read with me. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now notice 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. There's that word predestinate in Romans 8, 29. And I beg the Holy Spirit to enable me to recall passages correctly and perfectly for the glory of Jesus Christ. So there's the word predestinate. Now. Let's go to Ephesians 1. Let's read 3 to 5. Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. Okay. Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. How you doing, Sahilu? We're going to unpack Genesis 3 by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're going to go into the gospel. Okay. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Now notice, guys, Ephesians 1, 4 to 5. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Chosen us in union with Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. Now notice verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So that word predestined, predestination, predestinate, we find it used in the English translations of the Holy Bible. The question is, what does it mean for God to predestine us? That's the debate, isn't it? That's the debate, right? I pray the Lord Jesus bless this session, the sound, and even the clarity of the picture. You want me there? That's the debate. I don't have time to in, engage or indulge this debate. And this is a debate that will not be settled until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Until the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we're not going to settle this issue. That's just the plain fact of the matter. You're going to have your Calvinists. You're going to have your Arminians and everything in between. Right? Yeah. What about free will? I just said I'm not going to engage that discussion right now. The topic's not about predestination. I don't know how much clear I can make it. And here, I'm not going to solve the debate or answer the debate. In other words, if you're looking to me to solve this problem that's plagued Christians for centuries, you're looking to the wrong person. 
I am simply an imperfect, finite, temporal, sinful being who doesn't know everything. I have my biases, my opinions, my beliefs, and I pray the Holy Spirit will change any belief I have that's contrary to Scripture. Giants of the faith, men that I can't hold a candlestick to, haven't solved this debate, and you expect me to solve it? You with me there? Don't look to me. Even latent flowers won't settle debate for you. Don't look to me to solve this dilemma. This is a issue that has been with the church for centuries. At least we can say the Calvinist view, right? Until, you know, the Reformation. Anyway, I wish I was, brother. I wish. I have so many issues, imperfections, sins, anger, impatience, carnal desires that I beg the Holy Spirit to mortify and destroy in me so I can walk in the power and life of the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. I know the answer. <laughs> Don't make me more than I am. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6, and we're going to begin. See, Jeremiah 15, 16, here we go again. James White smashes Leighton Flowers. Leighton Flowers smashes James White. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. You may think James White smashes Leighton Flowers, but then there are people who think that Leighton Flowers smashes James White. So you're proving my point, brother. Jeremiah 15, 16, you just proved my point. Those who are Calvinists are going to think that James White smashes Leighton Flowers. Those who don't like Calvinism are going to think that Leighton Flowers and others smash James White. You just proved the point I just made. You just proved the point I just made. We're not going to settle this debate. We're not going to settle this debate, right? Because those who are for Calvinism are going to see their particular scholar or apologist as smashing the opposition. Those who are against Calvinism are going to see their scholar, pastor, theologian, apologist smashing the Calvinists. That's my point. See, now here's another. Man, I don't know. I think I'm speaking to the wall. D.M. Laney just said Calvinism is a joke. Guys, did you just catch what I just said? Jeremiah 15, James White sm smashes latent flowers. D.M. Laney, Calvinism is a joke. Thank you for proving my point, folks. Thank you. Thank you for proving my point. Okay. Now, James White, even though I probably had more issues with him than most of you, right? James White is a brother in Jesus Christ, used of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's done great things for the kingdom of God. Great things. He's also done a lot of things that have damaged his witness and caused people to stumble. But that's true of every apologist. I've done the same thing. I have offended people, hurt people, damaged people's faith, and been a stumbling block. May God have mercy on me and forgive me. But there are times in which you need to put people in their, in their place. Lane Flowers does great work for the kingdom, but he too has issues and he is wrong. Because again, on this side of eternity, no human teacher is perfect in his interpretation of the scripture. Now with that said, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 6. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 6. All right. Let's read that passage. Let's read it. And let's begin. Paul says, for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. In other words, even though I desire to boast to put you in your place, I won't be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be. Did you catch that? Shakespearean English. Did you see what Paul says? Lest any man should make me more than I am. Guys, did you catch that? Pay attention. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, let's focus on the Word. It's now time to get in the Word. Forget the side talk. Okay? Let's focus on the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit speaking through us for the glory of Jesus. You see what Paul just said? He just said, lest any man make me more than I am. Now, I can't hold a candlestick to Paul. I pray in Jesus' name. He makes me like Paul in Paul's zeal and love for Jesus Christ. To worship Jesus the way Paul did, to pray the way Paul did, to fast the way Paul did, to suffer the way Paul did, to preach the way Paul did, and even die as a martyr for Jesus Christ. If this man is telling you, who was filled with the Spirit and given power to do miracles and revelations, 
and gave us half of the New Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If he's telling you, don't make me more than I am, don't make any of us more than we are. Right? See, we have a barking dog here. Let's now send him on his way. Okay. Hold on. Block him from there. Hold on. I want to block him. All right. Anyway. Everyone with me there? Now let's begin. Let's talk about the gospel of salvation. The gospel of salvation. The good news of salvation. The good news of salvation. Are we ready? Let's get into it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's get into it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The good news of salvation. What does the Bible teach about salvation and why do we need salvation? Pablo is going to keep quoting 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 4. Pablo, I love you, but not too much. Can you stop quoting the same passages? Because we're going to go in depth by the grace of God's Spirit. Help me to help you. Be patient with me so I can be patient with you, my brother. Are we ready? Let's begin in Genesis chapter 2. Let's read verses 15 to 17. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Let's unpack it. Pray for me that the Holy Spirit will enable me to focus and bless you and save me from error for the glory of Jesus. And then give us the power to live out the truths of the gospel for the glory of Jesus. Amen? Are we ready? Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Pablo Valdez. All right, let's begin. We're going to wait for the brother to post verses for us. Genesis 2, 15 and 17. Thank Orbiter. Poor brother. A lot of pressure on him to try to post verses. Pray I get my muscles back, man. I got narrow shoulders. I got to expand them. All right, let's begin. All right. Hold on. Let's, let's hold on one second, guys. First and last, wait, don't delete him, man. I'm trying to block him. When you delete him, I can't go to his page to block him. I love you, first and last, but not too much. Orbit, are you here? Are you this? Okay, here he goes. Let's read. Guys, read. Read the text. Let's get into the word. That's the voice of God. And the Lord, Yehovah, Jehovah God, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Okay? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest, eatest, thou mayest freely eat. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue to pronounce the Shakespearean English of the King James. Very hard on my tongue. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day, now notice again, guys, pay attention to verse 17. God's warning to Adam. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now notice God's warning to Adam. Adam, you can eat of all the trees you want, but this tree of the knowledge of good and evil do not eat it, because in the day you eat, the day you eat, the day you shall die. Everyone with me there? Did you see the warning? The day in which you eat of that tree, the day you shall die. That's the day you will die. Did you get it now? So God said, you eat, you die. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Let's read. Now, before you post all of them, Orbiter, we're going to break it down. We're going to read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. But first, post Genesis 3, verses 1 to 5. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 5. Let's break it down. Let's go into Genesis first, and let me show you what we learned from Genesis regarding the effects of sin, the fall of Adam and Eve, the effects of sin. Pay attention with me, guys, please. Help me to help you and let me know if it's clear because I want to preach the gospel by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Christ. Right? Genesis 3, verses 1 to 10, but we're going to break it down. We're going to look at the first five verses. Okay? Genesis 3, verses 1 to 5. Chaldeans are not Muslims, Chaldeans are Catholic. All right? We're waiting for our friend to do this. Some of our brothers and sisters are not patient. They're already posting stuff. Wages of sin is death. And Be patient, friends. We're going to get there. I promise you. If you don't believe me, ask me. <laughs> Orbiter, did you get rapture and leave us behind? What's going on, bro? 
man, you're slow today. Okay. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord Jehovah God had made. Pay attention. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Is that what God said? You won't eat of any tree? Notice the twisting of God's word. That's not what God said. All right. And the woman said unto the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now notice, Eve is telling the serpent, God's instruction wasn't that we don't eat of any tree. So here we see the serpent twisting God's words. But she then says that the order was, don't eat of this particular tree or touch it, because if you do, you will die. Now don't forget Genesis 2.17 says, they will die the day they eat of it. They will die the day they eat of it. Now notice what the serpent says. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know, God doth know, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, guys, before we quote the rest, pay attention to what the serpent said. He's now questioning God's integrity and impugning God of being a liar. No, it's not spiritual death, Tipple Bear. Be patient, Tipple Bear. Please don't add to the words of Scripture and chime in by saying spiritual death. No, it's physical death yes there is a spiritual death but in the context the death that god is speaking of as the context will define is physical okay now watch me here listen to me carefully folk give me your undivided attention okay now give me your undivided attention the serpent questions god's integrity and impugns god of lying and holding back the truth from adam and eve pay attention Holding back the truth from Adam and Eve. Now, Orbiter, I love you, my brother. Why are you posting 6 to 10? Just let's be patient. Orbiter is nervous, man, and I'm making him more nervous. Why are you post posting 6 to 10, brother? I said, let's break it down and wait. You went ahead and posted 6 to 8. I didn't tell you to do that. Please, brother, thank you for helping me. But help me to help you and wait. My goodness. Let's wait for this guy to get it. Hold on. Yeah, if I block Orbiter, then I'm going to have to read, which I'm probably going to do. Yeah. So, Orbiter, are you with me? Are we on the same page? No, he's not listening. Hold on. He's not listening. Hold on. You got to wait. Orbit, are you listening? Are you with me? Are we on the same page? Just wait, hold on. All righty then. Sorry, guys. This is what we, we have to deal with. Orbiter is serving us for the sake of Christ for free. He's not getting paid for this. And this is the technology. Okay, so you with me? Don't post 6 to 10, brother. Wait, because I want to unpack verses 1 of 5. You do it again, I'll smash your face in, beat you to a bloody pulp, and then repent. All right? Okay, are we ready? All right, hold on. One second. Are we ready? Hold on. One second, folks. Michael, if you want, I'll smash your face in too and repent later. I'm an equal opportunist defender. Hold on. One second, folks. Sophie plays. I think it's uh, anyway. Let's see. Won't stop. Hold on. Have mercy, my God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Have mercy. I'm trying to see what's going on here. Hmm. Right there. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, guys. Sorry for the uh, distractions. Okay. Are we now ready? We lost the point, didn't we? 
You guys with me so far, or do we lose the point? Because, again, we're going to get a lot of distractions. I sense tonight is going to be a night where we're going to get distracted a lot because Satan is angry. What we plead, the holy blood of Jesus Christ to cover us, the blood of Jesus Christ to be our shield from the evil one in Jesus' name. No, uh, choose Jesus. Bruce Lee wasn't technically an atheist. That's something that atheists claim because they want to claim Bruce Lee as one of their own. I don't know why Bruce Lee came up, but you see you guys distracting left and right. You guys want me to shut down and restart? That's up to you guys. We can start over again. We're talking about everything under the sun. Bruce Lee was an atheist. Sam moves like Bruce Lee, not like Chuck Norris. Okay. Let's let's come back to the issue. Did you guys pay attention to Genesis 3, verses 1 of 5? Okay. Where the serpent calls into question God's integrity, right? Impugns God's character. By accusing God of lying, withholding the truth from Adam and Eve, basically saying that God has lied to you, Adam and Eve. He's deceived you because he hasn't been forthright with you. Do you see that? That the serpent has called God's integrity into question. With me there? Perez, join the club, brother. This is going to be one frustrating ride for you, too. I've been doing it for years. It's all right. Does everyone see that? I want to make sure you get it. Okay. Now, notice what the serpent said. Notice what the serpent said. Okay. Pay attention to what the serpent said. Okay. Here's another guy I want to block right now. Hold on. The serpent said, you shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. Right, right? And the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And you will be like gods, knowing good or evil. Now, notice what he said. You won't die. Pay attention. What's up, idiotai? You won't die. Your eyes will be open. And you'll be like gods, knowing good or good and evil. Now, believe it or not, Satan wasn't lying. We know from the book of Revelation, the serpent is Satan. Did you know he wasn't lying? Because they did not die that day, like Genesis 2.17 stated. Their eyes were open, and God said they have become like one of us. Let me prove it to you. Let's read Genesis 2.17 one more time. Genesis 2.17 one more time. Post that for me, brother. All right. Okay, post that for me. Genesis 2.17 one more time. God says, in the day that you will eat of it, you shall die. He didn't say you're going to die in the future, but that day you shall die. Okay. Genesis 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So Satan said, you won't die. Your eyes will be open, and you shall be like gods. Now let's go to Genesis 3, 22. Genesis 3, 22. Let's see, was Satan the serpent? Because we know the serpent Satan, according to Revelation. Did he lie? Or is he speaking the truth? Let's see. God bless you too, so I get this. The champ. Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Did you catch it? So, sir, the serpent is right. They have become like gods, like Yehovah God. Because they do now know good and evil like God. That's number one. Number two, they didn't die that day. God actually clothed them and banished them from the garden, but they did not die that day. And were their eyes open? Now he keeps telling me, like God's, yes, Joseph, Genesis 3, 5, the King James translates the Hebrew Elohim as God's. One more time, Genesis 3, verse 5. Genesis 3, verse 5. What did the serpent say would happen? How you doing? How you doing, brother? Genesis 3, verse 5. Ma Mark, do not read later verses into Genesis. Brother, please, don't help me to explain the text. You cannot... Let me, uh, All right. Even though I went to Revelation to identify the serpent as the devil, what you need to do is to exegete verses in their immediate context, understand what they mean in their historical, grammatical context, and then see 
the understanding of these verses in light of the totality of Scripture. That statement that a day is a thousand years to God comes from Psalm 90, verse 4, and 2 Peter 3, 8. Before you impose that meaning of day into the text of Genesis 3, first explain what these words mean in their immediate historical context. And you do that by looking at these statements in light of the book of Genesis, whether the chapter itself or the book as a whole, and then see its relationship to the other books written by the same author, Moses. And then you can, you, you get the point? You're not helping me when you make these comments. You're making it harder because I have to take a moment to then break this down. Folks, don't make it harder than it is. Okay? Let's focus and make it simple. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Okay. Genesis 3, 5, and 22, back to back. I don't want to make it hard for the rest of you because if I start answering these, I may lose you. There's an atheist here who is focusing. Let me know who he is. Okay. Genesis 3, 5, and 22. He did plan for them to live forever. Read. The serpent says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 22. God says, Behold, the man has become as one of us. Did you catch it? The serpent wasn't lying. That's okay, Andrew. You can come and listen all you want, as long as you don't attack and mock and blaspheme. I appreciate your respect, honestly. I don't care if you're an atheist. That's between you and God, the God that you don't believe in. That's between you and him. As long as you respect and don't blaspheme. Okay, did you catch it? The serpent said, the day you eat, you shall be like gods, knowing good and evil. God said the serpent was right. Hey, Rod, you know I'm going to send you. I'm going to show you the power of my knowledge by sending you on your merry way. Bye-bye, hey, Rod. Hold on, guys. Let me send this guy on his way. Did you catch it? That's what you get for being a sarcastic jerk. You caught it? The serpent didn't lie, did he? He didn't lie, folks. Did you catch the first point? Did you catch the first point? You shall be like gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3.22, God says, behold, Adam. Well, it's not Adam there. Or let, let me see. Let me double check. I don't know if it's Ish or Adam. Let me not speak presumptuously. Behold, the man has become like one of us. Glory to God for modern technology, because we can look at the Hebrew and the Hebrew into linear. Let me not speak presumptuously. I don't want to be mistaken. I pray the Holy Spirit will keep me from error. So then the serpent didn't lie. They did become like God and that they knew. Yeah, it's Ha-Adam. Yep, behold, Ha-Adam. It's not the word ish. Glory to God for modern technology. He says, behold, Ha-Adam, the man, Adam, has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Do you guys catch it? So far, the serpent seems to be right. So far, it doesn't look like he's lying. So far, he's right. Your eyes will be open. You shall be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, were their eyes open? Genesis chapter 3. Let's read 6 to 7. Genesis 3, 6 to 7. So far, they were right. It's okay. They can type. You guys can type as long as you focus and keep it relevant to the discussion. I don't mind you typing. But when you go off topic, then you're going to hinder me and then I hinder others. Let's be a blessing to one another for the glory of Jesus. Genesis 3, 6 to 7. Okay. No, that's not what it says. Don't chime in. Tachmonite. It says the day you eat of it, meaning you die. He doesn't say the process of death will kick in and you'll start dying slowly. Genesis 3, 6 to 7. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to the desire to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Notice seven, and the eyes of them both were open. Wow. Satan turned out to be right. Now I keep saying Satan because that's Revelation 3, but you don't need to call him Satan. Let's talk, stick to the immediate context, the serpent. Okay. Their eyes were open. That's what the serpent said would happen. They became like God and knowing good and evil. That's what the serpent said would happen. And they did not day, die that day. Just like the serpent said. Man, it seems like the serpent was telling the truth. 
Or was he? It seems like the serpent was telling the truth. Or was he? Now let's see where the serpent withheld facts. Now notice the serpent accused God of holding back pertinent details, of holding back all the truth, and just misleading Adam and Eve into thinking that negative consequences would result from their disobedience. Now understand, pay attention with me. Michael, I'm going to have to send you on your merry way. Okay? Okay, bye-bye, Michael. Hold on. Sorry. I just said don't do that. Don't quote another text to tell me what a day means. But, you know, Michael, this is how you're going to learn, my friend. I appreciate you, my friend. There you go. I appreciate you, Michael. Okay, good. Okay. Now, notice the serpent first accused God of lying, deceiving Adam and Eve by not telling them the whole truth. In reality, the serpent lied because although what he said was true, he withheld the fact that though their eyes would be open, though they would be like God, knowing good and evil, and yes, they didn't die that day, eating the fruit would then corrupt their mind, corrupt their thoughts, corrupt their will, and rob them of their innocence. Let me repeat what the serpent did. The serpent will take truth and mislead you by it because he realizes that if he straights up lies to you, that you won't fall for it. But if he gives you enough truth by which he disarms you into trusting him, then he can suck you in and eating the poison and kill you dead. So this teaches us how the serpent operates. The serpent will use truth to mislead you and kill you and damn you to hell. Because everything he said was right. But here's where he misled them. He failed to tell them that when they ate, the eating would corrupt their mind, corrupt their thoughts, corrupt their desires, corrupt their will, and rob them of their innocence. Because up until that time, Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed because their minds were pure, their hearts were pure, their thoughts were pure. So when they saw each other naked, they viewed each other in a state of innocence, of purity. Let's read Genesis 2.25. Genesis 2.25. No. Pure meaning that they didn't have corrupt, evil desires. Their thoughts were not corrupted. Their desires were not corrupted. They were in a state of innocence. Childlike innocence. Exactly. Genesis 2.25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They were in a state of innocence. It's like two children. You can put a young boy, two years old, young girl, three years old, in front of each other naked, and they view each other in a state of innocence and purity. They don't have corrupt desires for each other. They're in a state of innocence and purity. That's the state Adam and Eve were. Genesis 2.25, one more time. No, the world is evil because it's not just our thoughts that have been corrupted, but the world itself has been corrupted by Satan and evil spirits. Genesis 2.25. Genesis 2.25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now let's compare it with Genesis 3.7. Genesis 3.7. Genesis 3 7. Compare the two. I hope I didn't bore you guys with all this detail. I took longer than I thought on this issue. Genesis 3 7. Ah, Zina, Chati. Ya, Zina. Ah, Zina. Zina, let me stop my discussion and talk about Noah and come back to my discussion. Stuck for Allah. Only a Chaldean Assyrian would ask me that question. Ah, Zina, ah, ah. Okay, Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they show, sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? 
prior to eating of the tree, they were naked and not ashamed because they saw each other in a state of innocence and purity. Once they ate of the fruit, their minds became corrupted. So that which was pure became impure and they became the shamed of their nakedness and had to cover it up. You caught it? Do you see what we call, to use a technical term, the noetic effects of sin? Sin corrupts your mind. Sin corrupts your thoughts. Sin corrupts your desires. So that even something that is good and pure in of itself becomes impure and is misused for corruption and evil. Let me give you an example. Sex is a gift that God has given for a male and female in holy matrimony. Sex was created by God as a gift for a husband and wife to enjoy each other and become one flesh. Sex in of itself is not evil. It's the misuse of sex, using sex irresponsibly, using sex contrary to God's purpose for the creation of sex that makes it evil. So you see what happens here? That which is good now becomes corrupt and evil because of human beings who have been corrupted and tainted by sin, that they take that which is good and misuse it and make it evil. Is that clear? I hope I'm cl clear. By the grace of God's Spirit, may anoint me to speak truthfully, clearly, and accurately, and not confuse you. So they were naked and not ashamed. But when they ate of the tree, the tree, the fruit of the tree, affected their mind, corrupted their thinking, so that they no longer saw each other in innocence, in a state of purity, with a, with a mind that saw things in purity, but now their thoughts have been corrupted, tainted, so that which was innocent became impure and shameful in their mind, in their thoughts, in their heart. So that's the first effect of sin we see. Sin corrupts your mind. Sin corrupts your thoughts. Sin corrupts your heart. It has what we call a noetic effect, an effect on the mind. That's the first consequence of sin. It affects your mind. It affects your thoughts. It affects your heart. Is that clear? Is that clear before I move on to the next point? Yep, that's why I'm so corrupt. Is it clear before I move on to the next point? Now you see where the serpent lied to them? Though what the serpent said was true, he didn't tell them the whole truth. He didn't tell them that when you eat of it, your innocence will be taken away. You'll be robbed of your innocence. Your purity will be taken away. Your purity will be <clears throat> corrupted. In other words, now you will see things in an impure manner. You'll be robbed of your innocence and purity. You see what he, he withheld from them? You see what the serpent did? He didn't tell them the whole truth. He withheld from them the fact that by eating of this fruit, your innocence would be taken away. You'd be robbed of your purity. You'd become corrupt. That's the first effect of sin. Now let's continue. Genesis 3, verses 8 to 10. Genesis 3, 8 to 10. Joseph, I'm going to ignore your question because you're changing the topic again. All right. Genesis 3, verses 8 to 10. Let's take it to the next, next point. Genesis 3, verses 8 to 10. Yep, it is. Half truth, half lie. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Catch it. They heard God. They ran and hid. And the Lord God, Yehovah God, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Notice the effects of sin, which the serpent withheld from them. Before they ate of the tree, when the Lord God would appear, they would run to God. When God showed up, that was 
the highlight of their day. The living God is now with us visibly. The living God is having fellowship with us. So when God would come, they would run to God. They would have fellowship with God. They would be elated and excited that God was visiting them, right? But now because of sin, when God shows up, the reaction is not to run to God, but run from God. Hide from God. Run from God. Because they're ashamed to stand in his presence. Did you catch it now? You see the second effect of sin. Sin not only corrupts your mind, your thoughts, your heart, and robs you of your innocence and purity. Sin hinders you from running to God. Sin makes you run away from God. Because of sin, people don't look for God. They run away from God, avoid God, and want to have nothing to do with Him because they know if they run to God, they have to give up their sinful lifestyle, but instead enjoying their sinfulness and not wanting to repent of it, they'd rather run from God and hide from Him in order to justify their wicked, sinful rebellion. Do you see the second effect of sin? Before I move on, is it, is it clear? Are you guys seeing this? Thank you, Dilijan. Exactly. Do you catch it? Two effects of sin thus far. It corrupts your mind, thoughts, and heart. Robs you of your innocence and your, your state of purity. The second effect, it causes you to run away from God because you want to avoid God, because you don't want God to confront you because of your sinfulness. You'd rather hide your sin and shame than run to God and have God Deal with your sinfulness and remove it from you. So sin hinders you from turning to God. Sin causes you to run from God and cover up your shame. Now let's see the third effect of sin. The third effect of sin. Are we ready? Yep, it is. Because of that one act of rebellion, we are now in the hell that we find ourselves in. Thank you, serpent, Adam and Eve, for what you've done to this world. Anyway, the third effect of sin. Let's now read Genesis 3. We're going to read 11 to 13. Genesis 3, 11 to 13. Genesis 3, verses 11 to 13. And he said, he says to Adam, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? See, he knew that Adam's thoughts had been corrupted and tainted because of his rebellion. So he's asking, how did you know you're naked, Adam? Did you eat of the tree I told you not to eat? Now notice Adam's response. And the man said, the woman whom thou <clears throat> gavest to be with me, she gave me the tree and I did eat. And the Lord Jehovah, Yehovah, God, said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now notice the third effect of sin. Sin not only hinders you from turning to God, but causes you to run from God. Sin also causes you to find an excuse for your sin, to justify your sin, and also leads you to find a victim to blame for your sin. In other words, Sin hinders you from taking responsibility for your sinfulness. Did you catch it? Did you see the third effect of sin? Do you see the third effect of sin? Sin hinders you, makes you incapable of acknowledging your sin. What it does is makes you justify your sin, find an excuse for your sinfulness, and blaming something or someone else for why you did what you did instead of taking responsibility for your sin. 
So you see what happens now? The three effects of sin in Genesis 3. Sin corrupts your mind, your thoughts, your heart, robs you of your innocence and your purity. Sin also causes you to run from God in order to hide your sin instead of running to God, asking him to remove your sin. And thirdly, sin causes you to find something or someone to blame for your sinfulness, hinders you from taking responsibility for your action. You're welcome, Andrew Martin. Is everyone with me there? Do you see the three effects of sin which the serpent hid from Adam and Eve? So who was the liar? God or the serpent? God or the serpent? This also explains why God is asking Adam and Eve. Is it a coincidence? Folks, I want you by the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit opens our minds to see the depth of Scripture, to fall in love with Scripture and live it out for the glory of this God revealed in Scripture. I want you to meditate on this. Was it a coincidence that God showed up right when they sinned? Or do you see God's perfect timing? In other words, God showed up right when they sinned because God knew Adam and Eve were in trouble and he comes to their rescue. In other words, he wasn't asking them because he didn't know. He was asking them in order to get them to acknowledge their sin and thereby showing that now they'd become so corrupt that even when confronted with their sin, they would try to justify their sin fail to take responsibility for their sin, and blame the other. In other words, God didn't show up at that moment by coincidence. He showed up at that moment precisely because he saw Adam and Eve were in trouble and now had corrupted themselves. And he didn't ask because he didn't know. He asked to show Adam and Eve, look what you did to yourselves. Now when I confront you about your sin, instead of taking responsibility for it, instead of asking me for mercy, instead of saying you're sorry, instead of asking me to forgive you, which I, which I would gladly do, you now justify your sin, fail to take responsibility, and blame the other. In other words, because of what you did, you're now unable to repent, confess, and ask for forgiveness. You see what you did to yourselves, Adam and Eve? Why? Why would you do this to yourselves? Why would you take the word of a stranger and question my love for you when I gave you everything? Adam, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am, Adam? I am the one who created you with my own hands from dust and breathed into you the breath of life and made you a living soul. I'm the one who gave you the entire garden, in fact, the entire earth as your possession. I'm the one who loved you so much that when I saw you alone, I didn't want you to be alone, and I created a helper, took her out of you so she could be of like nature to complete you. And I'm the one who even brought the animals before you so that you can name them. I'm the one who did all this for you, and you would question my motive, my integrity, my love for you, and take the word of a stranger over against the one that walked with you, that loved you, that blessed you, and provided for all your needs. That's how you treat me, Adam? This is how you reciprocate your love? This is how you show your gratitude and love for me, Adam? When you're alone, who gave you a helper? I did. And when I created the animals, who gave you dominion over them? I did. And when I brought the animals, who named them as a sign of authority over the animal kingdom? I did. And the wisdom that you had in order to know how to name them and what to name them, who gave that to you? I did. I did this all because of my love for you. And this is how you respond. Adam, you broke my heart because you took the word of a stranger over against me. What else did you want me to do for you, Adam, to show you how much I love you? 
Eve, what else did you want me to do for you to show you how much I love you? I made you of the same nature of Adam. I crowned you as co-ruler with Adam over creation. This is how you treat me? Not only do you disobey me, but you run from me. And not only did you run from me, but instead of taking responsibility, you put play, uh, play the blame game. This is the love and respect you show me. What more could I have done for you, Adam and Eve? And this is how you repay me. It almost makes you feel sorry for God, right? It almost breaks your heart for God. Not for man, but for God. That he would go through all this and suffer all this because of his great love for mankind. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing, isn't it? Almost breaks your heart, right? In fact, it should break your heart for God. In other words, it should make you say, I'm sorry, God. Father, I'm sorry. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Holy Spirit, I'm sorry for running from you, for hiding from you, for failing to take responsibility for my sins and playing the blame game. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Makes me want to cry too, medic. I am so sorry for painting your heart. Folks, let me add this. Prior to creation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit loved one another with a perfect love, adored one another with a perfect adoration. They never experienced pain, sorrow, or misery because they always made one another happy. And yet God knew by creating this creation, he would have to experience pain, misery, anguish, grief, and anger. For the first time. So the only thing you've contributed. To the fellowship and love of the Godhead. Is misery, pain, anguish and grief. That's all we've contributed. Right. Thank you Andrew Martin. Coming from an atheist that's a blessing. I pray that the Lord will use this teacher. To produce faith in your heart. For the God who exists and loves you more than you can imagine. Let's go to Genesis 2 to show you again how much God loves Adam and Eve. Genesis 2, 18 to 20. Genesis 2, 18 to 20. It does make you want to cry, right? It makes you love God with a deeper love, doesn't it? With a greater love. Passion, right? Genesis 2, 18 to 20. Let's read. And the Lord God, Jehovah God, said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now watch here. And out of the ground, the Lord God, Jehovah God, formed every beast of the field and every fowl, fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature. That was the name thereof. You see the honor he gives? And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. Do you see the honor he lavished on mankind? That means God already created man with an intrinsic wisdom. What do I mean? God created man with an innate wisdom, an inherent knowledge, wisdom. Because notice God doesn't teach Adam what to name the animals. Adam knew instinctively, innately what to name them, right? Did you catch it? God said, here are the animals. You name them, Adam. I'll just watch. You understand the implication of this? That means the Lord God is now on earth in visible form, standing face to face with Adam, bringing the animals to Adam and saying, Adam, you name them. I'll just sit back and listen because I've given you power over them. You name them. In other words, God already created mankind with this innate wisdom and knowledge to know him. To know right and wrong. We were designed with that wisdom and knowledge from creation. But now that wisdom and knowledge has become tainted and corrupted by sin. Do you see it? Do you see that? I want you guys. Forget me. All Everything good is from God. Focus on what I'm saying. Do you see the honor he gives mankind? And what is Adam's response and Eve's response? To believe a stranger. Because for all intents and purposes, 
Yep, it was Jesus speaking with Adam. The serpent was a stranger. They took the word of a stranger over against the God who had gone out of his way to prove his love for them. Breaking the heart of God. And you know what's sad? You know, we do that to one another. I may know you for a while, but then someone may come and say, hey, you know, Orbiter was talking smack about you. Really? And the first thing I do is believe what that gentleman or that woman says about Orbiter, even though Orbiter and I are best of friends and I should know better. That's what Adam and Eve basically told God. God, in spite of the fact you've walked with us, you've gone out of your way to love us and bless us and given us the entire earth, all you ask for, as a sign of our allegiance to you, if you love me, Adam, just don't touch this. This will be a test. Do you love me enough to trust me? Don't touch this. Show your allegiance to me. Just don't touch this. You don't need it. You got everything. Even though he went out of his way to love them, a stranger comes, and the first thing they do is believe this stranger over against God. So the serpent did speak the truth, but not the whole truth. Yes, their eyes were open. Yes, they became like God, knowing good and evil. And yes, they didn't die that day, and I'll explain why. But here's where he lied. He failed to tell them, though your eyes would be open, it would be open to corruption. Now that your eyes are open, your minds would be corrupt, your hearts would be corrupt, your thoughts would be corrupt, your innocence would be taken away, you'd be robbed of your purity, you now would be running from God, no longer running to God, and you would fail to take responsibility for your actions. Playing the blame game. You see? Now let's go back again. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Let's read verse 11 and 12 one more time. Yep, Andrew Martin. I love this guy. In Jesus' name, you're going to be a follower of Jesus sooner than later. He said it, the death of innocence. Yes, Andrew. If you want to know when, where, and why this took place, the death of innocence, Genesis 3 is the chapter. Now let's read Genesis 3, 11 and 12. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest eat not? Did you catch it? Who told you? Now this was a chance for Adam to repent. And confess, but notice verse 12. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now, did you do you understand what Adam just did? He threw back in God's face the woman that God created out of his love for Adam because he didn't like the fact that Adam was alone. In other words, you know what he's saying? The woman you gave me, God, it's all her fault. In other words, had you not given me this woman, I wouldn't be in this mess. So he even took that which God gave to him as a gift of his love because it pained God to see Adam alone and threw it back in his face saying, well, it's the woman you gave me, God. Thank you. I'm in this mess because of you. Give me this woman. Do you see the appreciation? He even throws back in God's face. God's gracious provision of a helper of like essence to complete him so he wouldn't be alone as an expression of God's love for Adam. You got it? Now let me prove to you that God isn't asking questions because he doesn't know. He's asking questions to give Adam an opportunity to confess and repent. But then demonstrating, look how corrupt Adam and Eve have become. That even when I confront them, they don't confess and take responsibility. They try to find justification for their sin. Let me prove to you, he wasn't asking because he didn't know. Genesis 4, verses 8 to 10. I may have to do a part two, folks. Genesis 4, verses 8 to 10. Good, Joe Mama. I wanted to grieve because that's the response that we all should have by the power of the Holy Spirit, grieving over what we've done to the heart of God. Genesis 4, 8 to 10. 
I have to do a part two because I spent all this time on Genesis 3. Genesis 4, 8 to 10. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they're in the, in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord Jehovah said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth, un <clears throat> crieth unto me from the ground. Did you catch it? He asked Cain, Where's your brother? Cain said, do I know? And then God says, what you've done. The blood of your brother whom you murdered cries out to me. So did you catch it? God wasn't asking Cain because he didn't know. He asked Cain to show how corrupt Cain is, that in his wicked, evil, sinful heart, he thought he could lie to God and get away with it, and God exposed him. You guys catch it? Hey, Cain, where's your brother? Is it a coincidence God asks him right after he killed Abel? No. God shows up at the perfect time. So he waits to see, will Cain kill Abel? He does. Shows up. Oh, hey, Cain, where's your brother? How do I know, God? What do you mean, how do you know? The reason why I showed up is because the blood of your brother is crying out to me. Avenge my blood, O God. So God doesn't ask because he doesn't know. He asks to give you an opportunity to repent and or to show, look how corrupt you are, that even when I confront you with your sin, you still try to cover it up, justify it, and think you can get away with it. This also shows that Cain didn't really know God as much as he thought he did because he actually thought that God wasn't aware of everything. Are you with me there? Because if Cain, if Cain thought that God knew everything, the stupidest thing he could have said to God is, I don't know where my brother is. He would have said, well, God, you know where he is. You know everything. You know I killed him. But this again shows, this shows that Cain didn't have <clears throat> perfect knowledge of the God who made him. Like us, his knowledge of God increased over time because he learned more about who and what God is over time because obviously for Cain to think that he could get away with murdering his brother before God means that he wasn't aware that God sees all things and knows everything you guys see that yes it was here on earth is that clear before I move on I want everything to sink in did you see how much meat there is in Genesis 3? Who would have thunk it that Genesis 3 had so much to say about the effects of sin? So notice what we learned about the effects of sin according to Genesis 3. Number one, sin corrupts your mind, your thoughts, your heart. Number two, sin causes you to run away from God and hide your sin from him. It incapacitates you and makes you incapable of running to God and confessing your sin. Number three, sin hinders you from taking responsibility for your actions. Do you see that? Because I want to then go to the next point. I want to go to the next point, if you're ready. What's the next point? So far, what serp the serpent said was true, but it wasn't totally true. He wasn't completely honest with them because he hid from them the damaging effects of their rebellion. What about dying on the day that they would eat of the tree? Let's go to Genesis 2.18 one more time. Genesis 2.18 one more time. I'm sorry, Genesis 2.17, not 18. Genesis 2.17 one more time. And I'll sum up, and Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to do a part two. Because I am not finished with the gospel of salvation. I didn't even get into it. So, Lord willing, I'm going to probably have to do part two Friday, God willing. I won't have time tomorrow, Friday, Lord willing. But I got to do a part two. Okay. 
Notice what God says again, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So you're going to die the day you eat. But they didn't die. Do you know why they didn't die? Let me explain to you why. It's not because a day is like a thousand years in the sight of the Lord. And it's not because he meant spiritually. No, he did mean physical death. But why didn't they die that day? Why didn't they die that day? Let me explain why. See, Sagat said died spiritually. Let me repeat it again. It's not because God meant spiritual death. No, Sagat. You have to define the term death in its immediate context. And in the immediate context, the death that God has in view is physical death. How do I know? Go to Genesis 3, 17 to 19. Genesis 3, 17, 19. No, it's not because death began that day, Saul. No. Guys, be patient, please. I love you guys. Be patient. Genesis 3, 17 to 19. He's talking about physical death. Yes, they were created to live forever, Ewan, immortally. But because of sin, they would now experience physical death. Genesis 3, 17 to 19. No, not you, so I got the other gentleman who said death began. Yeah, death did begin, but God said, no, you're going to die this day. I'll explain it. Just be patient by the grace of the triune God. Genesis 3, 17, 19, that he has physical death in mind. Here you go. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. So now notice sin doesn't just affect us. It affects the earth. It affects zoology. It affects ecology. It affects plant life. It, it affects marine life. It affects the animal kingdom. It affects every part of creation. Did you catch it? Because of your sin, the ground is cursed. So sin also affects all creation. Boology. Uh, boology? Zoology. Lord Jesus, who's in my tongue? Right? Marine life. Ecology. It affects every part of creation. Thou, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is, post-1819 again. Right? Every part of creation, right, is affected. Right? Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So now you're going to get tired. You're going to get burdened. It's going to be wearisome. You're going to get fatigued. From tilling the ground. Fatigue will set in. Burden will set in. Tiredness will set in. Right? Physically, you're going to get weary and tired and burdened. Feeling beat down all because of your sin. Look the damage you did. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now notice 19. 19. Let's read 19. And the sweat of thy face. Shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground? See, it's physical death. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Physical death. Because of your sin, marine life will be affected. Plant life will be affected. Animal life will be affected. Ecology, zoology. You're going to get tired and weary and burdened, and you're going to sweat and fatigue to eat your bread, to eat your meat. And then at the end, you'll return to the dust and physically die. All because of sin. All because of sin. So they will die physically, but they didn't die that day. Why didn't they die that day? Not because God lied, but because God spared them. And had someone die in their place in order to pro prolong their physical life. See, Jennifer Salem again did it. Sister, yes, the process of death, physical death, began that day. But Genesis 2.17 is clear. They were supposed to die that day. What happened? God in his mercy shows us the principle of vicarious atonement. Either you'll die or someone will die in your place so you'll be spared the judgment. Genesis 3.20 is the answer, folks. Genesis 3.20. Here's the answer. Genesis 3.20.
Let's read it. Here's the answer. A physical death did take place that day. Not theirs. Someone else in their place because God in mercy extended their physical life. So he kept true to his promise. If you eat that day, you shall die. But in his mercy and love, spared them from dying physically that day by having someone else die in their place. How do I know someone else died in their place? Genesis 3.20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. I'm sorry. Because she was the mother of all living. 3.21. My bad. Because I'm always thinking of 3.20. 3.21. Genesis 3.20. 21. See, I said it again. Because Genesis 3.20 is where Adam names her Eve. Genesis 3.21. And I'll get back to 20. Genesis 3.21. No, it doesn't say lamb. Let's not guess and add to the words of Scripture. A death occurred. Genesis 3.21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord Jehovah God make coats of skins and clothe them. There you go, folks. In order to make coats of skins, that means someone or something had to provide those skins. Since Adam and Eve are the only human beings, that means God sacrificed an animal in order to make coats out of the skin of that animal. So a physical death occurred, an animal death. We're not told what animal. And that animal, by dying, provided the coats of skin by which God clothed their nakedness and shame. Did you catch it? So here in Genesis, God has already revealed the principle of vicarious sacrifice, substitutionary atonement. What do I mean? God has shown that either you will die for your sin or someone else will die for your sin so you can be spared and forgiven and live in his sight. Did you catch it? And this is a picture of Jesus Christ, our Lord as I will unpack it in part two, Lord Jesus willing. Everyone with me there? Now let's compare the final point, the final contrast. Genesis 3.7 and Genesis 3.21. No, choose Jesus. Animal is someone. Because it has soul, it has value, it has dignity, and is beloved by God. And God often likens us to animals. So don't call it a something. It is a someone. It has personality and a soul. Let's not get into that debate, please. Let's focus. Okay. Genesis 3.7 and Genesis 3.21. Exactly, Visa. Genesis 3 7 and Genesis 3 21. Choose Jesus, Lord willing. In the future, I'll prove that from Scripture. Let's focus. Guys, read these two. Please read them. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Genesis 3 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God, Jehovah God, make coats of skins and clothe them. Notice the contrast. When Adam and Eve clothed themselves, they were still naked and ashamed before God. God had to clothe their nakedness and clothe their shamefulness. What do you learn here? You will never be able by your own righteous deeds, by your own efforts, to clothe over your shamefulness and nakedness. God has to clothe you. You can't do it. Because when you try to clothe over your sin, God still sees through that and sees your sinfulness until God covers you. So what do you learn here? It's not by your efforts. It's not by your deeds. It's not by your righteous acts that you cover over your sinfulness, nakedness, and shamefulness. God and only God can cover your shamefulness, nakedness, and sinfulness. And he does so by sacrifice. Did you learn that too? 
Man, how much meat is there in Scripture? Man, how much meat is there in Genesis 3? Who would have thunk it that Genesis 3 teaches the gospel and lays the foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yep, tack, tack maps, you got it. Covered by the blood of Jesus, clothed with Jesus Christ. Clothed with Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 14. Romans 13, 14. God covering them, clothing them with coats of skin is a picture that we are clothed with Jesus, clothed with the love of Jesus, clothed with the blood of Jesus, clothed with the person of Jesus, clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Praise the Lamb of God. We love you, Son of God. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch it? Put Jesus Christ on as your garment and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You see that, Romans 13, 14? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothe yourself with Jesus Christ and do not indulge your flesh. Right? Infinitely great. Now, finally, the last thing that Adam and Eve realized that God wasn't going to cut them off permanently and forever, but that God in his love would restore them, <clears throat> atone for their sin, save them, forgive them, and reconcile them to himself. Notice what Adam says in Genesis 3.20. Genesis 3.20. Notice what Adam says about Eve. And we're done for this session. Lord Jesus willing, I'll do part, part two Friday. Part two, Lord willing, Friday. Gospel of salvation. Notice what Adam calls Eve. And Adam called his wife's name, name Eve, Chawa, Chava, because she was the mother of all living. Isn't that ironic? Why would he call Eve the mother of all living? When they were just sentenced to die and banished from God's presence. Ever think about that? Ever wonder why Adam named Eve the mother of all living? You ever wonder why? Think about it. You just got banished from the garden. You just got rebuked. You are sentenced to eventual physical death. Though physical death was delayed that day. Why in the world would you then go ahead and call her the mother of all living? Because Adam and Eve realized God had made a promise. From her would come the Savior. Genesis 3.15. Speaking to the serpent, he says, I will put hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He'll bruise your head and you'll bruise his heel. They understood the promise of the seed to be the promise of their redemption and salvation. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So they understood this promise that God gave to the serpent, that her seed will crush your head, was a promise of redemption, was a promise of salvation. And so Adam, realizing this, says, Eve, you're not the mother of death. On the contrary. From you shall come life, the life of us all, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. Now let's wrap it up. Is that clear? Are you guys getting it? Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Did you remember that with Adam and Eve, God asked them, Adam, where are you? Who told you you're naked? Did you eat of the tree I told you not to eat of? Eve, what have you done? He asked them, right? He asked them, but he never asked the serpent. Genesis 3, let's read 3 and 13 and 14. He never asked the serpent what the serpent had done. Because there is no forgiveness for the serpent. 
he remains condemned in his sin for what he did. Genesis 3, 13 to 14. Genesis 3, 13 to 14. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and did eat it. Now notice with the serpent, he goes straight to judgment. Verse 14, guys, pay attention. Straight to judgment. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this. Wait, God, why didn't you ask him? Because there is no repentance for the serpent. I don't need to ask. Because there is no opportunity for him to repent for what he's done. He will be straight up condemned for what he's done. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference here? According to Revelation, the serpent is the devil. But did you see the difference here? Adam, what have you done? Eve, what you've done. Serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed among all the livestock. No, it's not because the serpent's not creating the image of God. Don't add to the text. Please, I am blessed. Don't pervert the text. The plain reading is because there is no forgiveness for what the serpent did in deceiving them from trusting God. Do you see the difference? That tells you why God asked Adam and Eve. Number one, to give them an opportunity to confess. Number two, to show that they become so corrupt that they won't confess and take responsibility. And then when he goes straight to the serpent and pronounces judgment, showing you that in the case of the serpent, there is no repentance and forgiveness for him. You with me there? Did you get it before I move on? No, Zena, they did not repent. That's why God disciplines, rebukes them, and forgives them. See, Zena, that's a good question. Did Adam and Eve repent? No. But God still in his mercy forgives them, but disciplines them. And this is another thing that God does with his children. This is another thing that God does with his children. <clears throat> when a child of God refuses to repent, God doesn't cut them off and damn them to hell. He rebukes and chastens them and breaks them in order to restore them to himself. So Adam and Eve did not repent. So God then disciplines them, punishes them, and banishes them from the garden, but still covers their sin because at the end of the day, though they've been disciplined and punished in this life, they are now reconciled to him in the life to come. You with me there, Zena? Do you see the difference? In other words, if Adam and Eve had confessed and taken responsibility for their sin, God would have restored them, changed them, and kept them in. That's the implication. But by not confessing and taking responsibility, he then disciplines them, punishes them, banishes them from the garden, signs them to physical death with the hopes of restoration to himself in the life to come. What does that got to do with anything, Scott Harper? Can you show me in Genesis 4 where Cain and Abel are offering sacrifices because of Adam and Eve's repentance? What are you talking about? And Scott Harper, can you show me in Genesis 3 where they confess their sin and ask God for forgiveness? Scott Harper, can you show me in the chapter where they said, we've sinned, forgive us, show me? What in the world are you talking about? Anyway, if that's clear, let me give you the icing of the cake. Who was the Jehovah God, the Lord God, that spoke to them and appeared to them? Who was the Lord God that spoke to them and appeared to them? You don't need to guess Genesis 3, verse 8. And this is where the King James does a beautiful job. Other translations butcher the text and drop the ball. The King James does the job. Notice who they heard in the garden. 
Genesis 3, 8. Doesn't say angel of the Lord, Orbiter. You're adding to the text? And yes, it is the angel of the Lord that it's Jesus, but it doesn't say that. Genesis 3, 8. How do we know it's Jesus? Let's see. Let's, let me show you. It was Jesus. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. Bam, right there. It was the voice of God that walked. And they heard the voice of God walking. Bam, it's right there. It doesn't say they heard the Lord God walking. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking. So God's voice actually walks. Because God's voice is not simply his audible sound, but God's voice is the word that comes from his mouth that appears to God's servants, revealing God to his people. Bam! The voice of God walks. Because the voice of God is not simply God's sound that you hear, but the person whom we know to be Jesus of Nazareth. So you understand what this means? Jesus, the voice of God, the word of God, comes to seek and save his lost sheep. And notice when the voice of God, who is the word of God, who becomes Jesus, notice when he shows up, right when they are lost in sin, he shows up. Adam, where are you? I am here to seek and save those who are lost. Adam, what have you done? Luke 19.10. Luke 19.10. That's why the Aramaic translation of Genesis, the Jewish translation of Genesis in Hebrew, I'm sorry, in Aramaic, in Aramaic, the Jews translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Aramaic early on. These Aramaic translations are known as the Targumim, Targumim, the Targums. If you read the Aramaic translation of Genesis, They'll tell you, Jews, not Christians, who translate in Aramaic, will tell you it was the voice of the Word of God. The Word of God came. The Word of God cried out. The Word of God appeared. So even these Jews knew it was the Word of God, a distinct entity from God, sent by God, who happens to be God, who showed up. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Adam, where are you? Are you? Here I am, the voice of God. The Word of God will eventually become flesh from the Blessed Virgin Mary, will eventually be known as Jesus Christ. Here I am, Adam, looking for you because now you are lost. What have you done? Where have you gone? I'm here for you because I will never leave nor forsake you. <laughs> hallelujah. 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 Matthew 18, 11. The word in Hebrew is call, voice, sound. Matthew 18, 11. Jesus has been there saving his people from the beginning, from the serpent. Adam, what have you done, my friend? Eve, what have you done, my beloved daughter? For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Matthew 18, 11. You see it? Matthew 18, 11. He just quoted it, Jennifer sent him. Did you see it? It's the Lord Jesus, the voice of the Father, the word of the Father, appearing to Adam and Eve. What have you done, my friend? Adam, my friend. Adam, my beloved. Eve, my daughter. What have you done to yourself? Why have you broken my heart and brought this great pain and misery and agony to creation? Did I not love you enough? Had I not done enough for you? What have you done, Adam? What have you done? Clear, isn't it? Right? I hope you're blessed. I hope you're challenged. I hope you're convicted. I hope you now stand in awe by the power of the Holy Spirit at the depth, the beauty, and majesty of the Word of God and how real our God is. And our God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How real Jesus is and how much he loves us. Right?
Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to do part two, God willing, Friday, because I still haven't gotten into the gospel of Jesus Christ in depth. This is a precursor laying a foundation for what's to come. So, guys, here's how you can reward me. Pray hard for me and my daughters, my two angels. In fact, please, if you can't even fast for me, that the Lord Jesus will save me and my children. Two big dates that I need deliverance from. August 14, August 19, I need deliverance because the decisions on these dates can leave me penniless. Ask Jesus to show up, save me from it so I can continue to do the work of God, provide financially for my daughters and I to do the work of God and ask Jesus to keep me holy, to purify me so I can be a holy, obedient slave of Jesus, truly living for him, loving for him, uh, loving him and loving for him, loving you for his sake. Ask the Lord Jesus to increase my faith, my love, my understanding, my knowledge, my boldness, the anointing on me, on my voice to continue to glorify him, serve you more and more until Jesus takes me, and ask the Lord Jesus to help me start a new chapter in my life. Ask the Lord to release me because I want to leave Chicago in September, no later than October, if the Lord wills, and that he'll bring my girls to me and ask the Lord Jesus for a godly companion. If he's pleased, a godly companion to minister with me, to serve the Lord. I have my eyes on one, but ask the Lord to confirm it. His will be done. Amen. Amen. Ask Jesus to increase in me to love him more and love you more for the sake of Jesus. Thank you, Andrew Martin. Here's an atheist telling you to support me on Patreon. Please do. I need more supporters. If I get more people, then I can be fully supported for ministry. Still struggling, but God is good, right? And remember this, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. Lord, forgive me, please. Save me from my flesh. Purify me. Purify everyone present. Fill us with your spirit to love you, to be in love with you. You are God. We love you. We love you. And Lord Jesus, fight for us and our families. Fight for my daughters. Protect them, Lord Jesus. And vindicate me for your glory. And Lord, guide me to know your will and to live it out. And even when it comes to this decision of a godly companion. We love you, Lord Jesus. You are the Son of God. Risen, risen indeed. Maran Atha, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Pray for those things. August 14, August 19, God save me. Relocate me. Protect my children. Bring them into my life. Support me to support them. Bless you and grow in holiness, righteousness, and purity and love. More like Jesus, less like the world, less like me. And pray that God will confirm that decision about this young, godly woman. The Lord knows who she is. His will be done. Amen. Love you guys. See you Friday, Lord willing. Go back, listen to this session. Subscribe. Hit the like button. Pass this session, the gospel of Genesis 3, to others so that they too can be blessed for the glory of Christ. Take care. Lord bless you. The triune God lives, lives forever. Amen.